Hello students, this module has been made keeping in mind next. Now what exactly next is going to be actually nobody knows but yes we definitely know that it is going to be a really very clinically oriented pattern and the aim is so that you develop your clinical acumen from now itself. Now this module that I have made for you, I have focused on the application part. Now, we always read the topic separately, conditions of external ear, conditions of middle ear, conditions of inner ear. But when the patient comes to us in the OPD or when the case is given to us, it is not labeled. The patient does not come with a tag, I am a condition of external ear, condition of middle ear, condition of inner ear. Patient comes with a complaint. For example, patient comes with a complaint of hearing loss. So, when we have left separately that yes, these are the conditions of external ear and this is how they present. Middle ear conditions present like this, inner ear conditions present like this. Ultimately, when the patient comes to us with one complaint, are we able to think of all the DDs, differential diagnosis and with the help of our history and examination, are we able to narrow down our differential diagnosis to maybe one or two? With the help of further test, are we able to exactly come to a diagnosis? Yes, so uh, when everything is in our mind, when we know that we have read everything, but uh, we also know how to apply it, only then it is going to be of benefit. It is not that we have read so many tests, we are going to do all the tests in all the patients. Yes, with the help of history and examination, first we narrow down, we localize the area that is involved. And then whatever test is required to come to that particular diagnosis, we specifically do that only. So, are you able to do that or not? That is what we are going to check in this module. So, is this module going to be of help of, uh, to only those who are preparing for next? I don't think there will be anybody who will not be benefited by this. Yes, because the concepts remain the same and the more your clinical acumen is, the better you will be able to answer the MCQs also. So, let us start. So, the first case we have here is a patient of chronic mucosal otitis media was posted for myringoplasty. Before doing myringoplasty, the surgeon injects the anesthetic agent as shown in the figure below. Which nerves is the surgeon anesthetizing? Yes, I know you have read the nerve supply of the ear so many number of times. So, yes, this is where we use it clinically. Yes, whenever we are anesthetizing, doing surgeries of the ear, we should know that which nerves we need to anesthetize. And when we are anesthetizing that particular nerve, exactly which part of the ear is being anesthetized. And and which all surgeries in that particular part of the ear we will be able to do under local anesthesia peacefully. It is not a problem for the patient also, not a problem for the surgeon also. Yes. So, here the first question we have here is which nerves is the surgeon anesthetizing? So, let us see which nerves are, is the surgeon anesthetizing? The nerve 1. Tell me what is nerve 1? Yes, this one is. Yes, very good. The auriculotemporal nerve. What is 2? Two, any guesses? Yes, very good. This is the greater auricular nerve. And three, what is three? Yes, this is the lesser occipital nerve. Now, we know that the pinna has a lot of nerves supplying it and that is because the uh, once the cartilage of the pinna forms, the skin that covers the pinna comes from all around. And from wherever it comes, it brings along with it the nerve supply of that particular area also. So, the Pinna is supplied by nerves that supply all the area adjacent to the pinna. Yes, so if you remember this, it will be very easy for you to remember which part of the pinna is supplied by which nerve. If I ask you the entire part of the pinna, this part of the pinna. So here the skin will come from where? Yes, it will come from the adjacent part of the face. So this is supplied by which nerve? Yes, the mandibular nerve. Can you tell me the branch? Yes, the auriculotemporal nerve. So this part is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve. The most of the pinna, yes, most of the pinna, the uh, the skin comes from behind and it carries its nerve, that is the greater auricular. What is that? The C2, C3 branch of the cervical plexus. And this greater auricular, it comes from here supplying the angle of jaw and then to supply the major part of the pinna, the lateral as well as the medial surface, most of the lateral as well as the medial surface of the pinna. Now, here has been a repeated question that has been asked from you earlier that the 
angle of jaw is supplied by which nerve and why did they ask you this is because yes you very commonly confuse that angle of jaw this is the mandibular no this is not by mandibular the angle of jaw is a supplied whole of jaw is supplied by auricular temporal except for the angle of jaw which is supplied by the greater auricular nerve and the uh, uh, the medial surface of the pinna posterior superiorly that is by the lesser occipital nerve. So, these nerves are being anesthetized in the surgery by the surgeon. Now, why do you think is the surgeon anesthetizing the greater auricular and the lesser occipital nerve? Yes, is the surgeon operating on the tympanic membrane? No, the surgeon is doing a myringoplasty. Myringoplasty means he is operating on the tympanic membrane. So, will he need to anesthetize the pinna also? Yes, yeah, so that brings to me the uh, next question that where do you give the incision for doing a myringoplasty? Yes, the incision is a, usually a post oral incision. You can go trans uh, canal also, you can go uh, end oral also, but usually it is a post oral incision, which means that this surgeon is preferring going for a post oral incision, the wild incision, because of which he is anesthetizing the greater auricular and also the lesser occipital nerve. So, he is anesthetizing these two nerves. So, the next question that we have here is the injection site 1 will, one will anesthetize which parts of the ear? What is injection site 1? Injection site 1 is the auriculotemporal nerve. So, this will anesthetize the pinna that we know. Yes, it supplies the pinna. But why is the surgeon anesthetizing this nerve? Does the auriculotemporal nerve supply only the pinna or does it also supply any other part of the ear? Yes, the auriculotemporal nerve supplies not only the anterior part of the pinna, it also supplies the anterior part of the external artery canal and the superior part of the external artery canal. The anterior wall and the superior wall of the external artery canal is also supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve. And do we need to anesthetize the whole of the external artery canal as well as the whole of the tympanic membrane while we are doing a myringoplasty, while we are operating on the tympanic membrane? Yes, because when we give a post oral incision, after that we raise the skin from the external artery canal up till the tympanic membrane and that is when we put the graft. After that we put the graft. So, the, if the surgeon wants to do it in local anesthesia, he wants the complete ear of the patient, the complete external artery canal, the complete pinna to be totally anesthetized so that he will be able to do it totally in a painless way and in a very peaceful manner, yes. So, that is why he is anesthetizing the auriculotemporal nerve not only to anesthetize the pinna but also to anesthetize the external artery canal and also to anesthetize the same part of the tympanic membrane. The auriculotemporal nerve supplies the pinna, it also supplies the external auditory canal and it also supplies the tympanic membrane, the anterior and the superior part of the tympanic membrane. Yes, so which parts of the ear? The pinna, the external artery canal as well as the tympanic membrane. Okay, so will anesthetizing these nerves suffice for the surgeon to be able to do the surgery on tympanic membrane under local anesthesia? So, he has given anesthesia only to three nerves and he wants to do myringoplasty. Will that suffice? Or is there a need to anesthetize any other nerve also? Yes, see, we read the nerve supply of the ear so many number of times. But when you give anesthesia, you just think that, okay, I have given in the anterior part, I have given here, I have given here and that is okay. Will you think like that? Now, if you remember the nerve supply of the ear, if you know that the external artery canal is supplied not only by the auriculotemporal nerve but some other nerve also which is not being anesthetized when you are giving, in, in, when you, when giving an anesthesia in these nerves. So, if you know that then you will anesthetize some other nerve also. So, which other nerve supplies the external artery canal? Yes, the external artery canal is supplied by the auriculotemporal nerve and also by the auricular branch of vagus. What is that known as Arnold's or Alderman nerve? Where exactly is the vagus nerve? Yes, we know in the floor of the middle ear, we have the jugular bulb along with the 9th, 10th, 11th cranial nerves. The 9th nerve, it gives the tympanic branch which enters from the floor of the middle ear, forms tympanic plexus on the medial wall, on the promontory and it gives sensory nerve supply to whole of the middle ear and also to the medial surface of the tympanic membrane, right. And the 10th nerve, it supplies the tympanic membrane. It also supplies the floor of the external artery canal and the the posterior wall and the floor of the external artery canal and then it comes up till the concha to supply the pinna also. 
so if the surgeon wants to do this surgery in a total painless manner means definitely he will not be able to do unless and until he does not anesthetize all these nerves so yes what is the question that is asked? Will he be able to do it under local anesthesia just by anesthetizing these nerves? No, he will also have to anesthetize the vagus nerve. He will have to give anesthesia also in this part, in the conca part and in the deep, in the external trichinal, posterior wall also to anesthetize which nerve, to anesthetize the vagus nerve. Now, while doing lobuloplasty, that is repair of split lobule, which nerve or nerves will you anesthetize? What is lobuloplasty? Yes, you must have seen that that females who wear very heavy earrings or danglers, hanging earrings. What happens is that their lobule, the opening in the lobule enlarges, enlarges, enlarges till the lobule splits. So, when you repair that, that is what is known as lobuloplasty. So, when you are doing lobuloplasty, which nerve will you anesthetize? Yes, indirectly, this has been a question that has been asked as a fact-based question so many number of times in your exam. Lower one-third of the pinna is supplied by which nerve? Yes, major part of the pinna is supplied by which nerve? Yes, yes, which part, which nerve supplies this part of the pinna? Yes, greater auricular. So, only greater auricular or will you have to anesthetize some other nerve also? The whole of this part of the pinna, will it be anesthetized if you anesthetize just the greater auricular nerve? Yes or no? Yes, just greater auricular nerve, it supplies all the lower one third of the pinna. In fact, the most of the lateral as well as the medial surface of the pinna is by the greater auricular nerve. So, yes, which nerve? The greater auricular nerve. Now, if the patient comes to you to the OPD with a complaint of pain in the ear and on examination the ear appears normal, which areas will you inspect to find the cause? So, this is another significance why the nerve supply of the ear is asked so commonly from you. You will find so many patients who will come to the OPD with the complaint that there is pain in the ear and when you examine the ear, ear is absolutely normal. And this is a very, very common thing. So, if the ear is absolutely normal, where is the pain coming from? So, it is usually referred to pain referred otalgia. And that is why referred otalgia is a very, very favorite question almost of all the exams. Yes. So, from where, which all area will you examine? Yes, this you will have to tell me. You know the nerve supply, right? Yes. So, you will examine the very important, the TM joint. Yes, entirely TM joint. The dental conditions the tongue yes from the dental conditions from the anterior tooth of the tongue pain can come through the auriculotemporal nerve now if we are examining the oral cavity to look for dental infections or to look for ulcers of the tongue or conditions of the tongue which part of the tongue will you examine if the patient has pain in the ear will it be only the anterior tooth of the tongue or the whole of the tongue yes it will be the whole of tongue Yes, from the anterior two third pain can go to the ear through the lingual nerve. From the base of tongue, it can go through the glossopharyngeal nerve. So, you will not examine one one nerve separately. You will examine the whole of the oral cavity. You will examine the whole of the oropharynx. Oropharynx is all by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So, the base of tongue, you will examine the tonsillar area. Yes, not only this, you will examine the vallicula. You will examine the larynx and the hypopharynx. Why the larynx and the hypopharynx? Which nerve? Yes, the vagus nerve. And why is this very important? Many of the times, patients of carcinoma of the larynx, hypopharynx, oropharynx, they present with, with complaint of pain in the ear. Yes, recently I had this patient, he was around 70 years old and he came with a complaint that he has pain in the ear. Yes, and when I elicited the history, when I asked when do you have like pain, ear was absolutely perfect. So, what he told was that whenever I swallow, I have a very sharp pain in the ear. And it's very sharp pain because of which I uh, even try to avoid swallowing my saliva. I try to spit it out. Okay, so he was an elderly. He had the history of after that. Yes, I took the history of smoking also. He gave the history of smoking also. He was a chronic smoker. And when I examined the oral cavity was good, oropharynx, the base of tongue what was appearing and the tonsillar area was appearing absolutely fine. And then I did a... Uh, a laryngoscopy, uh, endoscopic examination to see the vallicula, the larynx and the hypopharynx. And what I found was there was a growth in the vallicula. 
So the growth was not very big because of fish probably it was not causing any difficulty in swallowing any obstructive symptoms. But the patient had a very severe pain whenever he was swallowing. And yes, the biopsy was taken and it was a squamous cell carcinoma. So that is why it is so important and repeatedly asked in your exam that what are the areas that you will examine if there is a patient who has come to you with pain in the ear and the ear ap appears normal. Yes, so you will examine the TM joint, you will examine the whole of the oral cavity, oropharynx, larynx, hypopharynx. Tell me more. Tell me more. Any other area? Yes, the cervical spine. The cervical spine conditions, they can also lead to pain in the ear and parotid. Can it lead to pain in the ear? Parotid tumors, can it lead to pain in the ear? Yes. Yes, that was a no-brainer. Yes. Tell me which nerves. From which nerves can the pain be referred from the parotid to the ear? One nerve, two nerves. Yes, okay. One is auricular temporal, the other is greater auricular. Greater auricular supplies the fascia of the parotid. So, both these can lead to referred pain to the ear following parotid infections or following parotid tumors. And yes, that was the question that was asked recently when it was asked as a uh, uh, fact based question or when it was asked as a clinical also that while doing following parotidectomy, patient complains of anesthesia in the shaving area. Yes, so anesthesia in the shaving area, this is because of injury to which nerve? Yes, so it is because of injury to which nerve? The parotidectomy incision is like this injury to the greater auricular nerve. In fact, the same thing can be asked as that following parotidectomy, you have to tell the patient that there will be anesthesia in some parts of the face, some part of the ear. Which part of the ear? Yes, the lobule of the ear. The lobule of the ear. Yes, and the, the, the lobule of the ear, even if there is anesthesia, is not very important. That is why it has not been asked like that. What has been asked is, is in the shaving area. Yes, because that is the area that is very important if there is anesthesia in that area. So, yes, that is why the nerve supply of the ear is important. And earlier when it used to be asked was as a fact base. But clinically, why is the nerve supply important? Yes, nerve supply is important because referred pain to the ear is very common and it is very significant. Yes, you have to rule out carcinomas of, of uh, they are early presentations of carcinomas of larynx of oropharynx, which if you rule out early, you will uh, save the life of the patient. Yes, otherwise these areas, carcinomas, oropharynx, they grow very quickly. So, that is why and also whenever you are doing surgeries of the ear, you should know that if you want to operate on this area, which nerves exactly you need to anesthetize, where exactly you need to give the anesthesia. So, a quick sum summary we have here. Yes, in conditions of the TM joint or dental condition, parotid infections, parotid tumors, anterior truth of the tongue pain can be referred through the auricular temporal and that is not enough. Which parts of the ear? Yes, with so the pinna, external canal and tympanic membrane. The whole of the oropharynx in tonsil and base of tongue pain can be referred through the glossopharyngeal that is the Jacobson's nerve and which part of the ear yes deep in the ear patient will tell I have pain that is the middle ear in larynx conditions pain can be referred through the vagus and that is the Arnold's or the Alderman's nerve which part of the ear yes the pinna external artery canal and the tympanic membrane and in cervical spine conditions parotid infections again it can be through the greater auricular and the lesser occipital nerve parotid is only through the greater auricular but yes cervical spine can also be through the greater auricular or the lesser occipital nerve and it will be the pain will be in which part of the ear yes only the pinna so, let us start with this next case. So, here we have a 24 year old intern who reports of decreased hearing and tinnitus in the right ear for the last two days. Right. Okay. So, yes, I have mentioned intern because this was, this is exactly the case of an intern who came to me somewhere in towards the end of the last year. And this case that I have given here, it is not only important that you come to a diagnosis. In fact, you will not be able to come to the correct diagnosis if you do not follow the correct path, the correct sequence of what should be done. So, yes, in this question, just see whether your approach to come to a diagnosis is correct or not. Just test yourself. And yes, this is the approach that you will follow in any patient who has come to you. Yes, so here the patient has come to you. It is a young patient who has come to you with a complaint of decreased hearing. Now, whenever such a patient comes to you with decreased hearing, 
do you can can you immediately tell the diagnosis what do you do do you just start on uh, jump on doing the examination of the ear or do you uh, immediately write some test to the patient that yes this patient has hearing loss for two days so let me just write down a hearing test and see whether he has hearing loss or not what do you do what do you follow Yes, the sequence that you follow should always be correct. Only then you will be able to narrow down your diagnosis and then come to the exact correct diagnosis, right? So, what is the first step? Yes, whenever the patient comes to you with a complaint of, with any complaint, the first step is take the history. Yes, for example, yes, just yesterday, there was this patient who came to me with a complaint that my ear is completely blocked, completely blocked. Okay, so I asked him for how many days, since, since when? He said, for the past around five days, my ear is completely blocked. Okay, so uh, just before that, was it absolutely fine? And suddenly it became blocked. Oh yes, actually I travelled uh, that day, and that day I took two flights. I had to go for some office work to Bangalore and come back the same day. So when I took the first flight, after that I felt my ear was blocked, and after the second flight, my ear felt completely blocked, and it has been blocked for the next five days yes so when the patient comes to you with some complaint it is not that you will immediately jump on okay you're having blocked ear let me examine your ear no you the first thing that you will do is you will always take the history the history will help you localize had i not taken the history and just examined the ear i would be lost i do not know what to look for in the ear so the history made my work so much easy that yes he is having barotrauma because of which he is having uh, this block filling of the ear right so i don't need to get any investigation done, I just know that this is the diagnosis. Once I have come to the diagnosis, all the tests are there for us to help us come to a diagnosis. Yes, so if I am not able to come to a diagnosis, then you, I will use the test, right? So, what is the sequence that you follow? When you get the test done, all that you are going to uh, test yourself whether you are doing it the correct way or not. And these things are for you to practice. The more you practice, the more it becomes a reflex for you. Yes. So, whenever the patient that comes with comes with decreased hearing, what comes to your mind? What comes to your mind? What can be the DD? What can be the differential diagnosis? Yes, accordingly you will take the history. So, yes, the first thing that has been asked from you is what significant history will you ask from the patient and that is the first thing that you will do. Yes, so when the patient has come with decreased hearing, we know that decreased hearing can be because of any condition of external ear. It can be because of any condition of the middle ear. It can be because of conditions of the inner ear, right? Any, any involvement anywhere here can lead to decreased hearing. A short history of two days is given. So, can I am just asking you, like, a, do you know of any condition of the external ear which can lead to sudden decreased hearing for two days? Yes, there can be wax. Wax can lead to sudden decreased hearing. Maybe the water entered the ear and the wax got swollen and there was decreased hearing. Short history. Yes. So, otherwise, whenever you are, you, you want to rule out a condition of external ear and middle ear, Yes, what is the important history that you take to rule out condition of external ear? Yes, history of pain, history of ear discharge. And this I have uh, told you repeatedly that if any patient you ask for pain in the ear, history of ear discharge, yes, and if the patient says yes, you have automatically ruled out the inner ear. Inner ear conditions will never have pain in the ear because there is no sensory nerve in the inner ear. Inner ear conditions will never present with discharge of the ear. So, if the patient has told you that I am having decreased hearing along with that, yes, there is pain in the ear also or there is ear discharge also, then you have localized the lesion that yes, the patient has a condition of either the external ear or maybe the middle ear also, maybe otitis media because of which there is discharge or acute otitis media because of which there is pain. So, for a ruling of conditions of the external ear, the history that you will take is the pain, the ear discharge. Yes, for the middle ear, you will ask for a sudden trauma on the tympanic membrane can lead to the uh, sudden hearing loss two days, yes. So, you will ask for any physical trauma. You will ask for any history of barotrauma. trauma as I told you in this patient who had come to me uh, yesterday. He had barotrauma, trauma following which there was sudden decreased hearing in the in one year, yes. So, you will ask history of history of trauma that can be physical, it can be barotrauma. trauma. So, all these are your differential diagnosis. So, whatever differential diagnosis you have in your mind accordingly, you ask the history. It can be barotrauma. trauma. It can be a, uh, you will ask the history of discharge. It can be a sudden, uh, maybe if there is pain also, it can be an acute otitis media following which the patient has had 
the decreased hearing, yes. So, it can be you will ask upper respiratory tract infection history. In the inner ear, can there be any condition which can lead to hearing loss in one year or hearing loss uh, is short history two days? Yes, there can be history of autotoxicity. There can be history or you have to rule out autotoxicity. You will have to uh, ask for history of noise trauma. Maybe this patient went for a party and uh, two days back and following that since then the patient is having decreased hearing. Yes, the patient can have sudden, sudden sensorineural hearing loss. Yes, so any maybe any infections, viral infections. So, you have to ask all this history. So, these will be your differential diagnosis. Accordingly, you will try to rule out any history of medication, noise trauma, yes, yeah, discharge. So, all this, you will take the history. Yes, and that is always the first step. Yes, note the sequence. This is very, very important. So, here we have, yes, so there is no history of your pain, discharge, upper respiratory tract infection, trauma, noise exposure or toxic medication, what I go. Yes, so all this history has been taken and it has been ruled out and no such history is present. Okay, so now what? This patient is sitting in front of you, hearing loss for two days, young, young uh, patient, hearing loss for two days and no such history, whatever you can think of, no such history. What next? What next? What will be your next step? Tell me, yes, yes, now you will examine the ear. You will examine the ear to see that... Mm, Yes, the patient is not giving any such history. Let me see if there is anything in the external ear or the tympanic membrane that I can see. So, yes, the next step is to examine the ear. Examine the ear. The on examination, the pinna, external artery canal, and tympanic membrane are normal. Okay, so patient came with hearing loss. You asked all the history of all the DD that you have had in your mind. If nothing was there, you examine the ear and up till tympanic membrane, everything is normal. So, up till tympanic membrane, everything is normal. What is your next step? Yes, so if ev everything up till the tympanic membrane is normal, it means that it means that you have now ruled out. It is not the external ear. It is not the tympanic membrane. So, now you have localized the lesion to be in the either in the middle ear or in the inner ear. Yes or no? Now, you know that the defect is either in the middle ear or in the inner ear. So, this will now decide your next step. Now, you want to find out whether the defect is in the middle ear or in the inner ear. Only then you can proceed further. So, do you have any test which will tell you whether it is a disease of the middle ear or the inner ear? Yes. Yes, very good. The tuning fork test. Tuning fork test. So, will a tuning fork test tell you it is a disease of middle ear or inner ear? Yes, tuning fork test tells you whether it is a conductive or a sensorineural hearing loss. So, if it is a conductive hearing loss, you have already ruled out the external ear, tympanic membrane, till tympanic membrane, everything is normal. So, if it is a conductive hearing loss, we know that the disease in this patient is in the middle ear. If it is a sensorineural hearing loss, then we know that the disease is in the inner ear, right? So, uh, let us see what the tuning fork test is showing. On testing with the tuning fork, 512 hertz tuning fork, the Rimi's test is negative in the right ear and positive in the left ear. And I have always told you that whenever you are doing the tuning fork test, whenever you are reading the tuning fork test, always write the finding along with reading. Otherwise, once you have completely read, you will be totally lost. Yes. So, and how do we notify it? How do we write it? Right ear, left ear, Rimi's and Weber's. Okay. Okay. So, on testing with 512 tuning fork, the Rini's test is negative in the right ear. So, in the right ear, Rini's is negative and positive in the left ear. And whenever we write this report, we will always write what we are thinking of. If it is negative, it can be either a conductive hearing loss or it can be, tell me, yes, a severe sensorineural hearing loss. Positive is, yes, either normal or sensorineural hearing loss, right? Okay. So, now, Weber's, the Weber's test, the tone was perceived louder in the left ear. Now, this patient tells us that this patient has decreased hearing in the right ear, right? He has complained in the right ear. So, we are focusing on the right ear. So, the Weber's is towards the left. So, if the Weber's is towards the left, what does it mean? If in this patient in the right ear there was conductive hearing loss, Weber's would be towards the right. 
if it was a we have only two dds right conductive hearing loss and severe sensorineural hearing loss so if it was conductive hearing loss in the right ear webers would be towards the right if it was severe sensorineural hearing loss in the right ear then webers would be towards the left yes so what is your diagnosis yes your diagnosis is a severe sensorineural hearing loss of the right ear right so diagnosis is a right severe sensorineural hearing loss anything else you would like to add on here yes do you remember the history is only of two days so anything else yes sudden 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 severe sensorineural hearing loss of the right ear yes okay so what will be your next investigation what next will you do patient came to you you first took the history then you examine the ear, uptil tympanic membrane, everything was normal. You localize the lesion to be in the in the inner ear with the help of your tuning fork test. What next? What next? Yes. Now you will go for a yes, you want to reconfirm that whether it is a severe sensorineural hearing loss, exactly what frequencies are affected. Yes, and what is the definition of a sudden? Severe or uh, sudden sensorineural hearing loss. Sudden sensorineural hearing loss is when there is hearing loss of more than 30 decibel in three continuous frequencies over a period of three days, right? So, more than 30 decibel in three continuous frequencies, you will come to know only by a audiogram, pure tone audiogram. So, you always, after a tuning fork test, if it shows some findings, some hearing loss, you always go for a pure tone audiometry. So, now let me tell you about this patient. Now, this in turn, he had uh, contacted me towards the end of last year and he at around 10 o'clock I think at night he had messaged that I am really depressed I think I've become deaf and please 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 help ma'am I am uh, in a very bad shape so when I called him he was crying badly on the phone and uh, he told me that he had around five to six days back he developed a lot of tinnitus in the ear and he felt that he was hearing, he was not hearing properly. By chance, he was posted in the ENT department only. So, he went to the ENT department to show and they did the tuning fork test. And yes, it was negative and they started him on some anti-allergics. Now, it was already around 5-7 uh, days. He was not having any benefit. And since he had uh, read the module on the tuning fork test on the uh, sudden sensorineural hearing loss, he was very scared. He went for an audiometry test himself and the audiogram showed that he had a severe sensorineural hearing loss and uh, uh, he was very, very scared and that is why at that time he messaged me. Yes, Why is it a diagnostic dilemma? Why is it so difficult to find out that there is a severe sensorineural hearing loss? Yes, so whenever you are doing the tuning fork test, Yes, you should know what is the proper procedure of doing the test. Yes, always you do Rini's and always along with that, after that, you go for a Weber's. Yes, if the Rini's is negative, you immediately don't leave it at okay, it is negative, so it must be conductive hearing loss. Yes, why is it important? Because if it is, if the Rini's is negative, it can be conductive hearing loss or it can also be a severe sensorineural hearing loss. And this, whether it is a severe sensorineural hearing loss or not, you will find out only by Weber's. Yes, so that is why it is very important that you do Weber's also. So here the next yes thing you have done an audiogram. So pick up the likely audiogram of the intern from the given audiogram. So yes, we have some audiograms give, being given and we have to pick up what the audiogram of the intern is. And we know that what are we looking for in the audiogram? We are looking for a severe sensorineural hearing loss of the right ear right this is what we are looking for okay and also have you noticed the sequence yes have you understood this that by chance this patient who had come to you with hearing loss on examination you found that there was wax in the ear suppose you found that there was wax in the ear or suppose you saw that there was a perforation of the tympanic membrane was there any need for going for a tuning fork test was there any need for going for a pure tone audiometry then? These tests are for you to help you to come to a diagnosis, right? But if you have already come to a diagnosis, is there any need for getting these tests done? Yes or no? No. So, which means that when will you get a tuning fork test done? 
In any patient, if by examining the ear, the external auditory canal is normal, the tympanic membrane appears intact and you are not able to find out what the cause is, you are not able to come to diagnosis, only then you go for a tuning fork test. If there is any patient of otitis media, the ear is discharging, there is a perforation of the tympanic membrane, the patient has come to you with hearing loss, patient has come to you with ear discharge, you examine, you see there is a perforation you make the diagnosis of a chronic mucosal otitis media. Is there any need for going for a tuning fork test in this patient? What will the tuning fork test show? It will show that there is a conductive hearing loss. There is no need for going for a tuning fork test to come to a diagnosis. Yes, before you to find out how much is the hearing loss, you can go for a pure tone audiometry. Yes, but, but uh, there is no need for going for a tuning fork test in this in the patient if already you are with a diagnosis. So, here uh, and in this patient, let us see whether you are able to pick up the audiogram or not. So, here we have four audiograms given. Let us see one by one whether you are able to find out. So, yes, we know how to read the audiogram. Do we know that? Yes. What we see first is which year. So, here we can see it is both the years. Whenever both the years are given, what we do is we pick up one year and the other year we totally ignore. Yes. So, let us pick up which year first. Okay, let us see the right ear. So, in the right ear, we have this. This is opening towards the right. So, this is the right ear bone conduction and R for right, R for round. This is the right ear air conduction. Okay, so what we are seeing is next thing what we do is we see whether it is normal or not. So, normal is up to 25 decibel. So, yes, what we are seeing is that the bone conduction in this patient is normal, right? In this patient, the bone conduction is right ear. About the right ear, the bone conduction is normal. Bone conduction is normal means what is normal? Bone conduction is a measure of sensorineural pathway. Sensorineural pathway is normal. Air conduction, we can see in this patient, there is defect, yes. So, air conduction is defective. Air conduction is a measure of conductive plus sensorineural pathway. So, sensorineural pathway we already know is normal. So, sensorineural pathway is normal. Where is the defect? Defect is conductive. Or very easy method is that you just see if the bone conduction is normal and if there is an AB gap. It signifies that there is a conductive hearing loss. So, in this patient, in the right ear, there is conductive hearing loss. And in the left ear, when you see the left ear, you see only the left ear. Left ear, again, what we are seeing is bone conduction is normal and there is an AB gap. So, again, in the left ear also, there is a conductive hearing loss. So, this patient has bilateral conductive hearing loss. This is not our patient's audiogram. The next audiogram, this one. Yes, the first thing is which ear? Which ear is this? This is opening towards the left. So, this is left ear and the cross. Yes, cross is also of the left ear. Yes, so here what we are seeing is next step is whether it is normal or not. Normal is up to 20, 25 decibel. So, now what we are seeing is that bone conduction is defective. Bone conduction is defective means sensorineural pathway is defective. And also the air conduction is also defective. Air conduction is also defective. Bone conduction is also defective. Both are defective. Equally defective means that defect is in the common pathway. What is the common pathway? Common pathway is the sensorineural pathway. Yes. Or simply you can just see if the bone conduction is defective and there is no AB gap. It signifies that the patient has a sensorineural hearing loss. So, this audiogram is of a left sensorineural hearing loss. Is it severe? Severe? Yes or no? Yes, it is severe means more than 70 decibels. So, yes, it is more than 70 decibels. So, we will add left severe sensorineural hearing loss. If there is a history of two days, it can be a left sudden severe sensorineural hearing loss. Can this be our patient's audiogram? Yes or no? No. Why not? Patient died in the right ear. So, no, not this one also, not this one. Okay, so the next, this is again which year? Both the years. Let us see one year first. Okay, left ear. Let us see the left ear. Left ear, we can see, let us mark what is normal. Yes, we can see that this left ear is normal in this patient. Right ear, we can see that the bone conduction is defective and there is no AV gap. So, in the right ear, there is a sensorineural hearing loss. Is it severe? Yes, more than 70 decibel. Yes, in more than 70 decibel, yes, it is severe, not in all frequencies, but yes, in some frequencies. So, can it be a sudden sen severe sensorineural hearing loss, yes or no? Yes, sudden means three days, within three days. In this patient, there is a history of two days and over three con continuous frequencies. So, yes, in 250, 500, 1000, in all the frequencies, he is having hearing loss more than 30 decibel. 
more than 30 decibel over a period of 3 days. So, yes, this is a right sudden sensorineural hearing loss. Severe, this can be a patient's audiogram. Yes. And what is this? Yes, in this, this, this is both the ears. There is hearing loss only in the high frequencies and no AV gap. So, it is bilateral sensorineural hearing loss in high frequencies. This can be either uh, autotoxicity or noise trauma or uh, press by cuses, the down sloping audiogram. And here, yes, in noise trauma, you see a dip at 4000 hertz that is the earliest finding but later on all the frequencies high frequencies get affected and becomes a down sloping so which one is our patient's audiogram this one is our patient's audiogram okay so we have come to a diagnosis now that yes this patient has a sudden severe sensorineural hearing loss we have ruled out rest all the causes so now when we have a diagnosis do we need to go for any other test no, we do not need to go for any other test. You will now, what you will do is you will immediately treat the patient. This patient is not only a diagnostic, this condition is not only a diagnostic dilemma, but it is an autologic emergency also. Why an autologic emergency? Yes, because if it is, uh, it, it is usually because of viral infection where we call it as idiopathic. And what happens there is because of the edema, there is compression, ischemia and the uh, the paresis of the nerve that is that leads to complete damage of the nerve. So, what we need to do is immediately reduce the edema by giving high dose steroids. So, we give the steroids and immediately the edema reduces and the hearing comes back to normal. But if it is not done immediately, later on the effect will not come. Once the nerve has got degenerated, the it will not regenerate again. So, yes, what you do here is how will you manage? You will start the patient immediately on steroids. How much is the steroid? Many a times I have seen that patients are started on steroids but very low dose. You are so scared to give the patient steroid. Yes, at least one, you have to give one milligram per kg per day steroid. Yes, and if within five days the response does not come, you give trans tympanic steroids. Trans tympanic steroids are given and if available, hyperbaric oxygen, carbogen, they are also beneficial here. So, yes, you this is the, this is how you manage and the trans tympanic steroid can be given with the help of either microvic. What is this microvic? This is the uh, way, this is the procedure to give, deliver any drug that you want to deliver into the inner ear. You put a grommet on the tympanic membrane first and then through that grommet a wick like a candle wick, yes, so it is a very minute wick, a pre-made wick that you pass through the through the grommet to rest on the round window membrane and whatever drug you want to de deliver into the inner ear, you continuously transfuse the wick with that drug. Now, in our OPDs, usually what we use is the spinal needle. Spinal needle, we load it with the steroid and we pass it in through the tympanic membrane and we push the steroid in the middle ear and we ask the patient not to swallow for around half an hour, keep his head uh, that ear up and not to swallow for around uh, half an hour in the lying position. So, he will keep uh, put all the spit, uh, the saliva, he will spit all the saliva, he will not swallow it so that the movement of eustachian tube is not there and the drug from the eustachian tube does not go into the pharynx. So, that is how usually we do in the OPD. So, yes, this in turn was immediately started on uh, high dose steroid and I asked him to get a uh, repeat audiogram after five days, but he was so restless. In three days only, he got the repeat audiogram done, and the response was very good. And within ten days, his hearing came back to normal. Though the tinnitus was still there, which was a little disturbing, which gradually we uh, came down. But yes, the hearing was came back to more or less uh, very yes less than twenty five decibel uh, level. Yes, so that is what. Uh, that is how you need to follow. Now, when we told that we are doing this, keeping next in mind. Yes, why I told you that to know the approach is very important for you when you're preparing for next. Now, why? Because when you are, when suppose you have finished your internship and you're just sitting and reading, you do you have any exposure to patients then? So now, if you are still in your preparation phase, you are in your undergraduate phase, you are still going to the hospital, you are doing your internship, you are seeing patients. So when you are seeing patients, you have the opportunity to repeat this 
to make this your reflex action that yes whenever you see any patient with any complaint the first thing is a differential diagnosis that should come to your mind and accordingly you will take the history next step is you do the examination and then if you have come to a diagnosis treat the patient but if at all you have not come to a diagnosis then you have to think which text should i get done now and that will depend upon what you are thinking of had in this patient the renees suppose in this patient the renees was negative renees was negative means uh, renees was negative because of a conductive hearing loss now in this patient what we saw he had a severe sensorineal hearing loss right but if in this patient there was a conductive hearing loss in the middle ear then we would have gone for tympanometry to find out the disease of middle ear that this patient was having yes so then you pick up what test you have to do yes so please follow this not only for ENT but for all these subjects you will see that when people ask you that yes what is the differential diagnosis that you have what is the history that you will take what test you will do you will see that it becomes so easy and you are able to revise the complete thing in every patient that you are seeing so the next question we have here is a 30 year old female presents with it is a 30 year old with bilateral decreased hearing over the past few years Okay, physical examination demonstrates normal external artery canal and tympanic membrane. Now, this I am not going to tell a lot about this because I want you to tell me how you are going to approach this patient. So, this is a female, a young female. Complaint is bilateral hearing loss. Is it sudden? No, it is over few years. On examination, external artery canal and tympanic membrane is normal. Yes. So, what is the differential diagnosis when the Yes, the external artery canal and the tympanic membrane is normal means this complete part we have ruled out. Now, we have to think of only the conditions of either the middle ear or the inner ear. Quickly tell me, yes, condition of middle ear which can lead to bilateral hearing loss over few years. When, when I tell you that think of condition of middle ear. Yes, the tympanic membrane is normal. You have to think only of conditions of middle ear. Middle ear, what do we have? We have the ossicles, right? We have the eustachian tube, we have the ossicles. So, if there is condition of middle ear when the tympanic membrane is intact, what condition can you think of? Something related to ossicles, like there can be ossicular fixation, autosclerosis, yes, ossicular discontinuity, or there can be eustachian tube blockade, serosotitis media, yes, yes. So, can it be bilateral hearing loss? Uh, if I am talking about the differential diagnosis, can it be autosclerosis in this patient? Yes, it can be autosclerosis. It can be, can it be a ossicular discontinuity? Yes, over past few years, patient has had, so maybe a few years back, patient had some trauma following which the patient has had bilateral hearing loss. Now, yes, this is not, whenever we make a differential diagnosis, it is not necessary that it will be exactly the diagnosis, right? We are just thinking of that maybe. Though it is highly unlikely that if there is a trauma, both the ears became, there was hearing loss in both the ears, yes. So, uh, so highly unlikely, but yes, we can keep it as a di differential diagnosis. There can be ossicular discontinuity. The ossicular discontinuity, yes, there can be, can there be serosotitis media? Over the past few years, there is bilateral hearing loss. Bilateral hearing loss in serosotitis media in adult bilateral. Usually in children it is bilateral because it is because of fatigue. Not in adult bilateral serostitis media can occur because of allergic conditions when there is increased production. Will it be over the past few years? No. So let us not keep that as the DD. In your conditions, tell me what can we think of which can lead to bilateral hearing loss over few years. When I taught you also in the modules, I have taught you separately as in your conditions which can lead to only what I go, which can lead to only hearing loss. Which can lead to which can lead to hearing loss plus what I go. Yes, so that is why when you read this, it is not just for reading. Yes, you have to remember that if there is any bilateral hearing loss that the patient is coming, can I think of any condition of the inner ear also? Yes, inner ear, what condition can you think of? Bilateral hearing loss. Autotoxicity? Yes. Noise trauma? Yes. So there can be autotoxicity. There can be noise trauma, noise induced hearing loss. Yes, can be pressed by QSS bilateral hearing loss. Bilateral hearing loss can be pressed by QSS, but see the age. Age is 30 year. In 30 year, will you think of pressed by QSS? No, it is above 50 years. No. So, our DD for this patient is it can be autostosis, it can be ossicular discontinuity, autotoxicity, noise induced hearing loss. Okay, so this is our DD for this patient. Yes, so what is our next step? So, your patient has 
bilateral degree is during you have made your dd confining to the localizing to either the middle ear or the inner ear so now you want to further localize is it the middle ear or the inner ear so what is the next step yes we have done all this in the previous question so now it would have become your reflex tell me yes next what you will do you have taken the history you have done the examination examination finding is already given up till tympanic and everything is normal yes you have made some differential diagnosis yes tuning fork test so next step is you will go for a tuning fork test you will go for a tuning fork test whether it is conductive or sensor neural so then you will localize whether it is middle ear or inner ear so yes so you have done a tuning fork test rinis is negative yes i told you always whenever the tuning fork is given we will write down okay so right ear left ear and rinis and webers okay so rinis is negative in both the ears and webers is centralized negative means what negative means either conductive hearing loss or a severe sensor neural hearing loss right again a conductive hearing loss or a severe sensor neural hearing loss okay now what do you think what will you choose conductive hearing loss or a severe sensor neural hearing loss any patient with bilateral severe sensor neural hearing loss over the past few years would should be she be sitting just like that no and bilateral severe sensor neural hearing loss is a highly unlikely condition it is very unusual that bilateral both the ears there is severe sensor neural hearing loss yes so yes i will go for it is a conductive hearing loss in both the ears and webers is not lateralized means in both the ears there is conductive hearing loss which is almost equal webers gets lateralized whenever there is a difference of at least 5 decibel in both the ears at least 5 decibel difference one ear is worse Uh, five decibel more than the other ear, so or the other ear is better five decibel more than the first ear. So here it is almost the same. So yes. So now what do you think? We had made some DD, no? We had made some DD. What was the DD? We had made the DD in the middle ear. Now we have confined that this is a conductive hearing loss means middle ear. So what was the things in the middle ear? We had thought of autostrophosis and auricular discontinuity. Let us see what. Autostrophosis. What was the history? It is a thirty-year female, bilateral hearing loss, few years. Does it fit in autostrophosis? Yes, it fits in autostrophosis. What investigation will you ask for next? Now I would like to. We would like to confirm our tuning fork findings. Yes, that there is a hearing loss. It is conductive. How much exactly? Which frequency? So for that we'll get a pure tone audiometry. Yes. So next is a pure tone audiometry. Okay, so Rini's is negative in both the ears. Pure tone audiogram shows a AB gap of forty decibel in both the ears. AB gap means conductive hearing loss. So that is also confirmed that both the ears is equal. It is conductive hearing loss. So now tell me what is your most probable diagnosis? Yes, bilateral conductive hearing loss and tympanic membrane intact means condition is in the middle ear. Thirty year old over the past few years slowly progressive. Yes, all of this points towards autosclerosis. Is that right? Yes. And which test will you do to confirm the diagnosis? Yes, this is by the audiogram. Also, you have got that there is some disease in the middle ear. In the middle ear, yes, we had two DD. One is autosclerosis, and the other is auricular discontinuity, which we were thinking of in this patient. Now, the more likely diagnosis that we are seeing is autosclerosis. Now, we want to confirm that yes, there is autosclerosis only. Which investigation? Yes, that is tympanometry. So you will get the tympanometry, and what will tympanometry show? If it is autostrophosis, yes, the AS type of curve, where the compliance is reduced, and the pressure is normal, middle ear pressure is normal, and the stapedial reflex will be absent because the stapes is fixed. It will not be able to move, so the stapedial reflex will be absent. So yes, this will confirm that this is a patient of autostrophosis. And what will be your advice regarding the management? what will be your advice regarding the management we know autostrophosis if it is active or if it is mature the management is different is this patient active or is this mature active or mature how do you know it is active by tympanic membrane tympanic membrane is flamingo pink or schwartz so here we see that the tympanic membrane is normal normal tympanic membrane right so it is mature mature what we know is that the what we have to do is that this foot plate is fixed we will Make a opening here. We will remove the suprastructure of stapes and we will put a prosthesis. What is that? That is a piston. So we will do stapedotomy. Which ear first? 
it is a worst year first in this patient in this patient both the year the same hearing loss then yes in whichever year the patient has a subjective sense of more hearing loss then you will operate that year so you will go for stepidotomy in one year first whichever is worst either by the uh, objective or by the subjective so yes so have you noticed that whenever there is any patient the first step is the approach is always the same be it be it tnt be it ophthalm be it medicine be it gynae always you first try to with the help of you have one symptom right one symptom with that symptom you try to have a complete picture or outlook a differential diagnosis accordingly with the history and examination you rule out you narrow down your differential diagnosis so that you know exactly which test to do which will help you come to the diagnosis and then you treat the patient is that clear so this approach is very very important to be known to be repeatedly done in your opds so that whenever now when you see the mcqs also you will see that always first what is mentioned patient came with this complaint history next will be mentioned the examination finding next will be mentioned the test finding yes so or it will be asked which test you will do so uh, if you follow this believe me your clinical acumen will really uh, become very nice and when you do the mcqs also it will be just a reflex now coming to the next question a 4 month old child was brought to the ent opd with a complaint of not responding to the loudest sound so now it is not an adult if it was an adult who has come to us with uh, hearing loss totally not hearing we know what the approach was right now this is a 4 month old child who has been brought to the opd with a complaint of not responding to the loudest sound how will you proceed what history will you take yes so whenever a child 4 month has come to you with the complaint that the child is not hearing in this child will you like to take a history to rule out external ear middle ear in a ear conditions will you like to take a history to rule out otitis externa otitis media trauma to the tympanic membrane or serous otitis media will you like to take all this history what do you think why do you think four month old child will have hearing loss is yes, a four month again this is very very important something which is repeatedly asked from you expected of you to know yes the the hearing loss in children and how do you screen it how do you manage it so tell me what will you think of taking a history what will you think of ruling out whenever there is a child a infant or four month old child who has come to you with the complaint parents have got the child is not responding to sounds yes we know that these at such a young age we are not going to think of otitis externa otitis media what are we going to think of we are going to think of any developmental abnormalities or damage to the inner ear inner ear abnormalities yes how can inner ear abnormalities occur what can lead to damage to the organ of cotti damage to the nerves damage to the membranous and the bony cochlea inner ear in such a small child yes yes the hearing loss that occurs at this age in the newborn period uh, in the in children yes usually it uh, in children one year two year yes by three years usually by that time the parents diagnose that yes the child is not responding to the sounds to the loud sounds so there it is usually what we think of ruling out is a is a hearing loss that has occurred either before birth that is prenatal period or in the postnatal period yes so which means that it can be either congenital congenital or it can be acquired acquired right acquired means because of what what in the postnatal period what is she will you ask yes because of meningitis meningitis can meningitis lead to hearing loss meningitis yes because of the connection between the brain and the inner ear either cochlear aqueduct or the internal acoustic meatus yes all this we have done in great detail when we did the anatomy right so yes there can be meningitis there can be hypoxia hypoxic damage to the nerves hypoxic damage to the organ of cotti there can be hyperbilirubinemia yes that can also lead to uh, 
uh, the that can also lead to hearing loss. There can be history of autotoxicity. Maybe some gentamicin or some medicine has been given to you while the child was admitted because uh, for meningitis or there can be noise trauma. There can be uh, ICU admission, ICU admission, ICU admission. Why? Yes, because of preterm. Preterm, if the child was preterm, because of which the child was admitted to ICU. Uh, in preterm, the lungs are not properly developed. So, chances of hypoxia and hypoxic damage is very high. So, this, these are the acquired causes and this is the history that you will take. Why? Because the parents will ask you, why is my child not hearing? My child is deaf. Yes, so you need to ask, you need to exactly know what the cause is. So that you can, whether it is a preventable cause, whether it is a not a preventable cause. So all the quiet causes are the ones which are preventable. What do you think? Is the congenital cause more common or acquired more common? What is more common? Yes, obviously the congenital is more common. Two third is congenital. One third is acquired. And out of the congenital causes, what can be the congenital? Congenital can be genetic. Congenital causes can be genetic. So you will ask history, family history. You will ask any history of or you will you will um, examine the child for any syndromes yes some there are some cert certain syndromes which are associated with hearing loss along with that there is craniofacial abnormalities or so why is that important why is that history important if this child has a genetic hearing loss then uh, the genetic counseling can be done that this child of yours is deaf and maybe the next child also you have might be deaf so that is why in such a small child the trauma to the parents is a lot the further development of the child is very very important which will happen because of hearing so it is very important that you know why exactly the child has uh, developed hearing loss and in the congenital causes the other causes are maternal causes and in the maternal causes what can you think of what in the mother has occurred which has led to hearing loss in the child yes either maternal infections out of which the leading causes, leading infection is CMV or it can be because of maternal autotoxic drugs that the maternal, that the mother has taken. Any autotoxic drug mother would have taken in spite of knowing that she is pregnant. Yes, TB. TB drugs, if they are given in the first trimester, yes, they lead to the damage of the organ of corti. Yes, so we know that genetic or the maternal causes, they usually affect in the first trimester. We know that around 20 to 25 weeks, the organ of corti is completely developed. So, when the damage because of genetic or because of maternal infections or because of autotoxic drugs, they occur, they usually occur in the first trimester. So, developmental anomalies can occur. Uh, the most common developmental anomaly we have seen that there can be many developmental anomalies um, of the membranous as well as the bony labyrinth. Most, com most common is the shibi. Shibi. Yes, which is involves both the saccule and the cochlea. Now, I am just mentioning all this here because we have read this, right? And when we read this, it was not, not just for just reading that yes, this is this is to find that this is the anomaly. You have to know that yes, any uh, all these anomalies, dysplasia of the inner ear can occur during the first trimester, and that can lead to hearing loss. That can be a cause because of which the child is born deaf. Yes, so you will take all this history. So now there is no significant prenatal, postnatal, or family history, and on examination, the pinna external articular and tympanic femur looks normal. Okay, so you have taken the history and you're not finding any significant history. There's no acquired, uh, any cause of acquired hearing loss there. There is no maternal history. There is no genetic family history present. It's just that the child is not responding. What is your next step? Had it been an adult, you would have just, uh, after examination, you would have taken a tuning fork. Yes, you would have done the tuning fork test. You would have confirmed with an audiometry. Yes or no? Yes. In this child, four months. Can you do a tuning fork test? Can you do an audiometric test? No. So, what will you do? Now, here in this child, we know that what is important is that the child is not hearing most likely because of damage to the inner ear, developmental anomalies of the inner ear, which must have occurred because of any congenital or the acquired cause. So, what is important for us to find out whether the inner ear is functional or not, the organ of cot eye, the sensory organ of hearing is functional or not. Yes, so it is not that the same same gown will fit everybody. Yes, it is not that all tests and all procedures will be same. It depends upon, you have to think, what is your DD? 
what is your dd in this child your dd is inner ear abnormalities because of either prenatal or postnatal causes accordingly will be your investigation so what will be the test that you will do in this child do you have yes and it cannot be a subjective test this has to be objective test child will not cooperate four months old child yes so it has to be objective test and it has to be a test that will tell you about the uh, inner ear the organ of cotta because that is where our focus is our differential diagnosis is mainly on the inner ear because of whatever cause the prenatal or the postnatal cause yes now i have given you all the hint you will tell me which test yes so now you will go for auto acoustic emission you will go for autocaustic emission and yes you have done this the child was sent for autocaustic emission and on the report was written refer now it was written refer on the report refer means what so what is the interpretation of the report what does refer indicate for this we need to know what exactly we are doing in autocaustic emission yes the great details i am not going to share here yes but we know that what is autocaustic emission the one that we test is by giving a sound that is known as as evoked autocaustic emission yes so evoked autocaustic emission what we do is we give a sound and this sound goes into the uh, from the middle ear from the external ear into the middle ear from the middle ear into the inner ear and because of the sound in the inner ear the basilar membrane moves and that leads to activity of the outer hair cells the activity of the outer hair cells produces a sound which is reflected back into the middle ear and from the middle ear into the external auditory canal and this sound can be picked up by a probe in the external auditory canal and this sound is what we call as autocaustic emission right so if the autocaustic emission is present if if the autocaustic emission is present we call it as pass okay we call it as pass and if i tell you that the that the report of this patient was pass what does it mean tell me the interpretation if it is pass if it is pass it means that yes the outer hair cell that is the organ of corti is normal is that all or does it tell you something else also does it also tell you that the middle ear of this patient of this child is also normal if there was any defect in the middle ear would the sound be able to go from the external ear into the inner ear and would the activity of the outer hair cells the sound produced by the activity of the outer hair cells be able to travel back from the middle ear into the external auditory canal no so if there is any defect in the middle ear leading to a conductive hearing loss of of around 35 decibel autocaustic emission is going to be absent because the sound will not go into the inner ear and not travel back yes so if it is present it is not only indicated that the inner ear is normal the organ of cotta is normal it's also indicated that the middle ear is normal is that clear the middle ear is normal is that clear okay so now if the autocaustic emission is absent we never say it is fail yes imagine the the Uh, impact it will have on the parents the first test the child has undergone and the child has failed yes so always what you say is it is refer 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 for what refer for what? yes so if it is negative can you authoritatively tell that the inner ear the organ of cotta of this child is damaged can you tell that no before labeling such a huge thing that the organ of cotta is is not functional you will have to be very sure that is the middle ear functional is the sound actually going inside and coming back is it the problem of the middle ear because of his autocaustic emission is absent so when you refer the first thing that you refer for is to test that the middle ear is normal or not so you go for a tympanometry and if the tympanometry is normal then you repeat the test and if still the autocaustic emission is absent then you know that the middle ear is also normal tympanometry is normal so now if the autocaustic emission is absent it is because of defect of the organ of cotta only yes so now you want to confirm that yes there is a cochlear damage and also you want to know that the how is the function of the nerve is the nerve functional in this child why because if the organ of cotta is damaged what will be our rehabilitation do we know something which replaces the organ of cotta yes the cochlear implant so if we are going to put a cochlear implant should the nerve be functional for that yes so we will also have to check the nerve so we will refer the child first to rule out whether the middle ear is normal or not that is by tympanometry and the next is we will go for a vera 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 yes the test which will tell you about the uh, the cochlear whether it is the cochlear or retrocochlear damage and whether the nerve is functional or not 
So, you will refer, refer means refer is for these two things. Yes, so how will you proceed? How will you proceed? We will go for a tympanometry and we will also go for Vera. So, what is the protocol for newborn hearing screening? So, yes, this is very, very important. Each one of you should know that yes, all children, whether born in private sector or in government sector should undergo newborn hearing screening. If there is any hearing loss that is present, if at all present, the earlier the rehabilitation is done, the better it is. So, that is why the earlier the hearing loss is detected, the better it is. And in newborn hearing screening, we know that the part that is usually involved, as I have told you in earlier slides also, that the part that is usually involved when a child is born deaf, when a child does not has hearing loss, difficulty in hearing at such an early age in few months or uh, early years, so, the, the part that is of the ear that is usually dysfunctional is the inner ear. That is because of either acquired or congenital abnormalities, most commonly congenital abnormalities of the uh, inner ear. So, to focus that, to find out whether that part, the inner ear is functional or not, we need a test which is objective test because it is a child that we are testing. So, the objective test that we do to find out the function of the inner ear, yes, can you tell me what is that? Yes, the autocaustic emission. Which one? Do we test the evoked autocaustic emission and the evoked autocaustic emission again can be transient evoked or distortion product details I am not telling you. Yes, we have done it in the module but which one do we test for screening? Yes, the transient evoked. So, let us see what the newborn hearing screening protocol is. Now, any child that is born should be subjected to a transient evoked autocaustic emission that is within 48 hours, preferably within 48 hours of birth and maximum this should be done within first month of the child, yes, of the child's life. If the child was admitted to ICU for whatever cause, then we know that hypoxia can lead to uh, damage of the nerve, can lead to neuropathy. So, that in those children, we directly go for Bera. So, in children in ICU, in units in ICU, we directly go for Bera. Otherwise, the best screening method for rest, all the kids is autocaustic emission. It is very easy to do. It is cost effective. Even a lab technician can do it. The result is available immediately. So, for all that reasons, we use transient evoked autocaustic emission. If it is normal, if it is present, if trans, uh, if the autocaustic emission is present, it means we label it as pass. And if it is pass, then it means that the middle ear as well as the inner ear is normal. Now, if this is not a high risk child, high risk child means that there is some history of phototoxicity, hypoxia, there is some history of uh, uh, noise trauma or any uh, ICU admission. But Right now, the hearing is normal, but still this is a high risk category. In this, in these patients, we follow up the child. Okay, So, if it is high risk, we follow up. But if it is not a high risk, then no more screening, nothing more is required. Now, if at all the autocaustic emission is not present, what do we call it? Fail or negative? We call it as refer. Yes. So, if it is absent, then we call it as refer. Yes. Refer for what? Yes, refer to find out whether the middle ear is normal or not. But in newborn, in newborn, many a times what happens is that in the external optic canal also there is vernix or something which is obstructing. So, in newborn what we do is before we take up, refer the child for a tympanometry, we first rule out that the external auditory canal is normal or not. Is there some vernix or wax something in the external auditory canal? So, we clean the wax or the vernix from the external auditory canal and after 7 days, we again go for an autocaustic emission test. If it is normal, it means again pass, that is good. Okay. So, we clean the external auditory canal of mecanium or vernix or wax and then we repeat. Now, if it is pass, it means that whatever autocaustic emission when it was absent, it was because of this defect in the external artery canal because of which the sound was not going inside. And if uh, after you have cleaned the external artery canal and repeated the autocaustic emission, again the autocaustic emission is absent. Yes. Now you want to rule out is the middle ear normal or not, right? So then if it is absent, you refer for tympanometry. So if the tympanometry is, is abnormal, if the tympanometry shows some defect in the middle ear, so then what you do is you correct the defect of the middle ear if it is correctable. By chance there is some meconium in the middle ear also, yes? so it will get corrected by its own. So if it is correctable defect, you correct it. By chance if it is not correctable, 
then the defect in the ear is because of the middle ear you go for a hearing aid in the child yes any uh, child with any hearing loss the rehabilitation of hearing has to be given as early as possible so if there the tympanometry is abnormal it shows a middle ear defect correct the defect if not correctable then you go for a hearing aid as early as possible but if tympanometry is normal and still the autocaustic emission is absent it means that the middle ear is also normal sound is going into the inner ear but there is a dysfunctional organ of cauti because of which the autocaustic emission is not produced because of which it is not recorded so it indicates that there is some defect in the in the cochlea in the organ of cauti and then you want to find out you want to reconfirm and you want to find out the status of the nerve also then you go for bera so if it is normal if the tympanometry is normal then you go for vera and this all the referral tests that you do should be done maximum should be finished maximum in a period of 3 months time which means that the screening early screening that is transient or uh, evoked autocaustic emission should be finished ideally in 48 hours or maximum within the first month of the child and if at all you have referred the child for test then all the tests which you have referred the child for should be done in maximum 3 months time Yes, and if the bera shows that there is a cochlear defect, cochlear defect, yes, then you go for hearing aid as early as possible. Why not cochlear implant as early as possible? Because cochlear implant, tell me the age. At what age do you do go for cochlear implant? Yes, one year of age. So it is sometimes you misunderstand it that the earliest rehabilitation of hearing that we give is a cochlear implant, and that is at one year age of age. No. the cochlear implant is at one year of age but before that if you have found out that the child is deaf or the child is is diff has difficulty in hearing then you is hearing impaired then you go for some mode of rehabilitation and that is with the help of hearing aids so you go for a hearing aid and uh, at one year of age you go for cochlear implant and this rehabilitation should be done maximum means you do should not delay it more than 6 months means if you have found out that there is some hearing loss at least at 6 months of age you should have given the child some more mode of rehabilitation of ear if by chance it shows that there is a auditory nerve defect there is a nerve which is not developed the cochlear nerve a placea is there in that case the cochlear implant will not work cochlear implant replaces the organ of cauti and it directly stimulates the auditory nerve so if the nerve is not there cochlear implant will not function so then you will have to go for a brain stem implant and that is done at around 1.5 to 2 years of age so this is the hearing protocol uh, here the new one hearing screening protocol which all of you should know so this is what is known as the 16 136 rule one is means maximum at 1 month the screening should be done screening you should have you should be done with the screening at 3 months all the referral test referral test should be done finished and at 6 months rehabilitation of hearing in the form of hearing aid should be offered so this is the 136 rule now if the test shows bilateral profound hearing loss due to cochlear damage pick up the mode and the age of rehabilitation from the following so if by chance you have done bera see you did autocaustic emission autocaustic emission if it was absent tympanometry is also normal means there is a defect of the cochlea you went for bera when you did bera in bera you found that there is a profound hearing loss you went for hearing aid as early as possible at one year you will go for cochlear implant so here bilateral profound hearing loss due to cochlear damage pick up the mode of uh, and the age of rehabilitation so uh, earliest at earliest whenever you have diagnosed go for hearing aid at one year cochlear implant let us see what is given from where we have to pick okay so these are the four things from which you have to pick what mode of rehabilitation what is this what is one what is this yes one is the partial auricular replacement we can see this one this is a socket this has to fit in the ball what is the ball the stapes head yes so this is partial whenever we put the auricular replacement processes on the stapes head that is the partial auricular replacement processes when we put it on the foot plate of stapes that is total auricular replacement processes so this is pulp this is pulp right what is this this is the yes this is the piston that is used in stapetotomy so let us see here yes so this is how the pulp is put if you put it over the stapes foot plate that up till tympanic membrane that is what is torp yes and this is Yes, the stapes piston. 
following is epidotomy and autostosis. And what is this? Yes, this is the Baha bone anchored hearing aid. When you go for when you go for Baha bone anchored as a name, you anchor it to the bone. Otherwise, the normal conventional hearing aid we anchor it to the pinna. So when do you go for a Baha bone anchored hearing aid? When you cannot go for a normal conventional hearing aid. A normal conventional hearing aid is non-invasive. You can just put it, remove it whenever you want. A Baha is invasive. So when you cannot go for a normal air conduction hearing aid, you go for a bone conduction hearing aid. And what are the conditions when you cannot go for a normal air conduction hearing aid? Yes, whenever there is, as you can see, atresia, atresia of the external auditory canal, atresia of the pinna, or also in this patient, there is no atresia of the pinna. Still, you are using Baha. Why? Yes, because it is a bone conduction, bone anchored hearing aid. It directly stimulates the cochlea not only of this side but also of the other ear. Why? Because when it uh, when it picks up the sound, it vibrates the skull. Because of vibration of the skull, the other cochlea also gets stimulated. So, whenever there is one side which is totally deaf, as we saw. In some people who have a sudden severe sensorial hearing loss, one ear is completely gone. So, in them we can give Baha. So, this will pick up sound from this side also and transmit to the other ear, the normal ear which will then identify the sound. So, the patient will have some localization of sound whether the sound is coming from this side or this side. So, it can be used in, in severe, in deaf ear of one unilateral deaf ear also. And what is this? Yes, this is the cochlear implant. So, where is... Yes, yeah, so which one? The three is Baha and four is cochlear implant. So, this is cochlear implant. So, yes, we will go for in this child cochlear implant and this cochlear implant is passed into the middle ear through the facial recess into the inner ear through which window? This you tell me. Yes, yeah, so the round window, it replaces what? It replaces the organ of corti and it stimulates what? It stimulates the cochlear nerve. So, the cochlear nerve has to be functional. List two contraindications of putting this device and the investigation which will help you find this. So, tell me any contraindication. Okay, tell me any dysplasia of the ear, uh, of the inner ear, where you cannot put a cochlear implant. Yes, when the cochlea is absent, totally absent, like in mycoplasia. Mycoplasia, inner ear is absent, cochlea is absent, where will you put the implant? Yes, and another is, so one is the absent cochlea and the other is absent cochlear nerve. If the cochlear nerve is not there, Yes, what is the use of putting the cochlear implant? It ultimately has to stimulate the cochlear nerve. So, in these two conditions, you will not put a cochlear implant. And how which investigation will you do to find out this? Yes, for bony abnormalities, we will go for a HRCT. And for if you want to find out the cochlear nerve is there is a plasia or not, for this will uh, HRCT suffice or an MRI or, or MRI? Yes, MRI. MRI for soft tissue, it is MRI for bony abnormality is HRCT. If you want to see any abnormality of the membranous labyrinth, again, will you go for HRCT or MRI? Yes, then you will go for MRI. How would your approach be if it was a two-year-old child brought by the parents to the ENT OPD with a complaint of not responding even to the loudest sounds? Now, if it is a two-year-old child, can you go for a pure tone audiometry in this child? No, you cannot. The pure tone audiometry can be done in children above 5 years, preferably in children above 7 years of age. No, not in 2 years of age. Yes, so usually nowadays what we do is we directly subject the child to autocaustic emission because it is a sub, it is an objective test and which is very, very simple to do, very, very cost effective. Yes, but there is something which is known as behavioral or, uh, observation audiometry, which all of you should know about. Now, what is this behavioral observation audiometry? In this, we give sounds to the uh, patient to the child and we observe the change of behavior of the child in response to the sound. Always remember this very important point that this is a very basic investigation and you can think of it as a replacement of pure tone audiometry in children because you cannot go for a pure tone audiometry. Can I tell that pure tone audiometry is a very basic investigation of hearing in adults. It is uh, almost usually the first investigation that we do to find out whether what hearing loss it is, whether the patient has hearing loss or not. Yes or no? Yes. So, similarly in children, the replacement of pure tone audiometry is behavioral observation audiometry. The child might respond, might not respond to what you are seeing. So, what you do is you see the change of behavior of the child in response to sound and with that you interpret whether the child is hearing or not hearing. So, what are these behavioral observation audiometry tests? Now, 
from they are different according to the age of the child from birth up till 4 months we know that child gets startled by loud sounds so if it is a 4 month 2 month 3 month old uh, child which has been brought by the parents to the opd they are not sure that the child is hearing or not in the opd itself what you can do is you can check for startle reflex or palpebral reflex you can just ask somebody to give a very loud sound and you can see that the child just presses the eye yes arousal reflex if the child is sleeping and uh, you ask somebody to play a very loud sound the child may suddenly startle the child may suddenly wake up so these will just give you a working knowledge that yes the child is hearing the child is not totally deaf yes now if it is a child 5 months to 2 years of age these children are usually able to localize whether the sound is coming from this side or this side so what you do in them is that you place loud speakers all around something like this yes you place loud speakers all around the child is made to sit here in the parent's lap and different loudness of different frequency sound is given sometimes from this loudspeaker sometimes from this and you observe whether the child is turning the head to the source of the sound or not if the child is turning the head to the source of sound it means that the child is hearing this is what is known as a free field audiometry why a free field because you're doing it in an open area a free field yes now uh, usually when we do audiometry how do we do audiometry yes we test it in a closed room where the audiologist sits outside and the patient is given sound with the help of headphones in air conduction as well as in bone conduction and the patient when he hears he raises the hand or he presses the uh, light which is in his hand to indicate that yes he has heard the sound that is what is normal pure tone audiometry whereas in this test what you are doing is you are just giving sounds from loudspeakers and you are testing whether the child is your observing the behavior of the child where the child is turning the head to the source of sound now how is this different from pure tone audiometry yes i told you that the behavioral observation audiometry you can consider it as a replacement of pure tone audiometry in children yes how is it different yes how is it different in pure tone audiometry we can test the air conduction sound as well as the bone conduction sound separately we can come to know whether it is a conductive or a sensorineural hearing loss whereas here what we are testing we are just giving a sound and we are seeing whether the child is turning the head or not yes so even if the child is is deaf from one year completely the child is hearing only from one year the child will turn the head so we will not know the child is responding from which year if the child is deaf from one year also completely we will not know yes second if the child is more than 2 years of age around more than 1 and 1/2 to 2 years of age we can put headphones or we can put ear inserts so that we can localize whether the child is hearing from this year or this year when we give a sound from this year he is responding or not when we give a sound from this year he is responding or not yes but still what are we testing we are giving the sound only in air conduction so we will come to know only that the child is hearing the sound or not whether the air conduction is good or not if the child is not hearing we will not know whether the defect is conductive or it is sensorineural can you make out that if i ask you that is the play audiometry equal to pure tone audiometry or is it inferior to pure tone audiometry yes definitely it is inferior to pure tone audiometry in pure tone audiometry at least you can come to know whether it is conductive or sensorineural here you can just get a basic working idea that the child is hearing or not this loudness of sound this frequency of sound sound child is hearing or not if the child is not hearing you have no clue whether it is a conductive deafness deafness in the middle ear or in the inner ear that is why this behavioral observation audiometry is nowadays not usually done for diagnosing the diseases we have better objective tests like uh, like uh, autoacoustic emission like bera or suppose if you are suspecting in any 2 uh, or 3 years old child cirrhosotitis media you can directly go for tympanometry all these are objective tests we have those tests so uh, for finding out whether there is hearing loss or not or what is the hearing loss we usually do not nowadays go for behavioral observation audiometry nowadays we go for these tests to check whether after hearing aid has been given to the child after cochlear implant has been given to the child the child is now responding to sounds or not which we expect that if any sound is given the child should respond that is what is known as the free field audiometry now uh, in addition to free field audiometry is visual reinforcement audiometry what is this is that when the child looks to one side 
Suppose the sound is given from this loudspeaker. Toys are placed on the loudspeaker. So when the child turns the head, after some time the the toy is played, placed is is played. So if it is a joker, the joker will start jumping. If there is some lighted toy, the light will start blinking. So that will catch the attention of the child, and the child. This will be a reinforcement of the child that whenever you hear sound, turn your head. So why? Because we know that the attention of the children is very difficult to maintain. So these tests of behavioral observation audiometry, be it a free field audiometry or visual reinforcement audiometry, these are not very easy to do. They require a lot of patience. They require a lot of time. That is why nowadays we better directly go for autoacoustic emission, Vera, or for tympanometry, depending upon what our requirement is. Now, children of 2 to 5 years, they respond to instructions. So, in them, what we can do is a play audiometry. What is play audiometry is we uh, engage the child in some form of game. We give the child a bowl, a basket which contains some balls and we ask the child, whenever the child hears the sound, he has to transfer the ball from one basket to the other. So, if the child responds, we know that the child is hearing. So, as we can see that this is a very, all this behavioral observation audiometry are very basic test. They will just tell you that the child is hearing or not hearing. This much loudness sound the child is hearing, not hearing. If at all the child is not hearing, you are clueless whether the defect is in the middle ear, in the inner ear, in the nerve, right? So, if at all you have to, I ask you what is the sequence? If at all you have to do all these tests, what will be your first sequence? Uh, what will be your sequence? What will be the first test? followed by which test, followed by which test, yes. So, always if at all you have to go for a behavior observation audiometry, then where will you place it? That will be the first test. First will be behavior observation audiometry. If the child is not responding in this, then we know that usually children of this age, they do not hear because of some defect in the inner ear. That can be because of a congenital or acquired abnormality. You go for then autocaustic emission. If it is refer, we know then we go for tympanometry. And we go for Vera. Is that absolutely clear? Will you remember this? Yes. So, that is what we needed to know is the protocol, whether it is an adult who has come to you with hearing loss, whether it is a child, whether it is a newborn. And I hope you got it. You will revise it. Yes, not theoretically only, but also when you see patients. What is the sequence of history, examination, which test? Which test in adult, which test in children, which test in an infant, yes? 